shall we get this show on the road? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're going to, Michael, you're here. Of course. They sent the test for your introduction. <laughs> Firstly, let me, uh, before we even start, let me thank Michael Jones, who is the superintendent of the Illinois Lottery, for flying over and apologize for all the mistakes we had made in his room bookings. We've had him move hotels. We've had him thrown out in the morning. We've had all sorts of, we've sent him to the wrong hotel when we got here. The day in the jail was the most fun, I must say. Yeah, yeah well, that, that was free. That's included. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of the Irish experience. Perfectly man. normal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so let me apologize from all of us for any confusion you've had. And thank you for flying all the way over yeah. to, uh, to come and share our show. Um, we're going to be recording this show because I'm sure that a lot of people are going to want to watch this online. And so if you do have questions for Michael, please wait for the microphone so that the audio feedback goes directly into the little sound deck thing that we have back there. And um, yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, um, we're going to hear from Michael Jones, superintendent of the Illinois Lottery, who's launched the first live real money online gaming product in the United States. Yeah. Michael, thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you very much. And uh, as I told Michael, uh, and I ran the lottery in the early 80s, we'll get into that, and then I had a, a varied business career over the last 25 years and was asked to come back and run the lottery uh, by the governor in this new paradigm, you know, the whole private manager and then internet lottery test. And the major reason for that was that really it was my company's Michael Jones and Company and independent uh, now gaming research that um, created it. I mean, we're the guys that figured out that there was a lot more potential in lotteries than had ever been recognized before and that um, you know it needed a different paradigm to realize that potential. And at the same time, uh, we did all of the basic research on why uh, selling lottery tickets over the internet with their existing games could be a huge business. But in the previous 25 years, as I told Michael, we did a lot of trade shows and I have, I, I know all of the horror stories about trade shows. I know all of the horror stories about people showing up and there are no hotel rooms or or anything else. So I really appreciate what your staff has done. I really appreciate being invited today. And we should have a little bit of fun over the next 25 minutes. I've stripped down because I watched the Patty Power uh, presentation earlier. <laughs> and Patty was down to his undershorts by the time he finished because he, he's kind of an irreverent guy. And it's really hot up here. I know it's pretty warm back there, but it's, it's hot up here. So let's get going. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about lotteries, gaming, and iGaming. And we're talking about two things that aren't mentioned a lot when you talk about these things, and that is what is correct public policy and what is uh, good business practice. And in the lottery business and in the gaming business, those two things should go together. I mean, there should be a, you know, a way to uh, have good public policy, which generally means you know, responsible gambling and um, doing things the right way, and good business practice, which means encouraging private companies to make money. So let's. Uh, Let's begin by just talking a little bit about lotteries. Uh, you know, it's one of the things that I realized over many, many years when I would go to gaming conferences, we organized the World Gaming Congress and Expo in, in Las Vegas for many years, that the people who come to look at lotteries from the gaming side never understand lotteries. I mean, they don't get them. Their ethos is completely different. The DNA is completely different. Sitting here the last couple of days listening to a number of presentations, the language is different. And I want to sort of uh, illuminate that a little bit because for you all who come from basically the gaming side, uh, it may help you in terms of how to um, sell your products or, uh, yeah, sell your products to the lottery industry or get in on what is going to be, I think, a brave new world of iGaming that will be potentially under lotteries. So why is a lottery different? Well, a lottery is different for a number of reasons. Number one, it's usually a public monopoly and it is organized for a very specific reason and that is to raise money. So all of the language surrounding uh, player acquisition and maximizing expenditure per visit to a website or uh, player values or entertainment in the lottery business comes down to what Thomas Jefferson said. He was one of our early presidents and it's a great quote that you can always use to disarm any reporter. You know, the lottery is a wonderful thing. It lays the tax only on the willing. So the Illinois Lottery has been around since 1974. I was the third director way back in the 80s. Uh, over the many years, it's contributed about $17 billion to the, the state. But just to show you the difference between strategies and running lotteries, when I was recruited to run the lottery the first time, I came from business, and I knew nothing about lotteries. I just looked at it as a product and discovered, based on what Thomas Jefferson said and others, that it was a wonderful product. I mean, you ask people something very different than the, the gaming uh, 
experience that most of you come from. I mean, you do ask people to risk a small amount of money against very, very long odds to win a very large prize with the net proceeds going to the common good. And when you do research, I mean, the grand prize, the large prize is important. But almost always, the most important thing is that people believe that their losses are going to something that they believe in. Now, why is that? Because everybody loses playing the lottery. Everybody just shuddered. I know you're in the gaming business, but you're not supposed to talk about people losing. Everybody loses playing the lottery. Now, why do they? Well, it's a completely illogical thing to do. But the reason they do it is because of that ethos, because they realize that it doesn't really make any difference who you know or where you went to school or what your job is or anything like that, that a lottery provides you with an absolutely equal chance of winning something. You know, you'd have a chance to win it's not that you're going to win. And that where the money goes, if you look at states in the United States where there's a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship between a lottery loss and something that impacts your life, those states tend to be more successful than other states, like Georgia, where all of the money from the very beginning of the Georgia lottery went to fund scholarships. Scholarships for every graduating senior from every high school in the state of Georgia that has a certain academic level they get free scholarships to go to college. It revolutionized, completely revolutionized, the inner city uh, cities in Georgia, where all of a sudden it didn't require an athletic scholarship as your only path to go to school. You could go to school if you did well in school. And that's why lotteries are different than other forms of gambling. So I came back. So 1981, 1985, I was 11 years old when I began the lottery in 1981. Uh, and I was 15 when I left. And um, people have asked me what, uh, what it's like to come back. And it's deja vu all over again. I mean, the classic Bill Murray movie. It's the um, same thing I found in 1981, that the lottery brand is irrelevant to most people. You have a core group of players, they play all the time. Everybody else, the lottery products are invisible. Lottery proceeds, where the money goes, unknown. And if not unknown, then looked at with suspicion. Lottery creative, got awful. I mean, it was got awful. Uh, shortly after I became lottery director, we changed advertising agencies, which we'll get into in a second. It, the creative was really targeted, and you can see it in a lot of lottery advertising, about odds and winners, which are illogical. I mean, the odds aren't good, and people don't win. And the lottery definitely, definitely was not cool. So this is the picture that my staff made me put up here to show you what you do when you're a lottery superintendent when you're 30. You go do all kinds of promotions. This is at the Billy Goat Tavern, the famous cheeseburger, cheeseburger, you know, no co Pepsi from Saturday Night Live. That's Sam Sienas, who is John Belushi, basically, in the middle. And that's a lottery ping pong ball from our creative that we had be a short order cook for a day. This is sort of like Patty Power in, in miniature. And that guy with the weird rooster hair, I don't know who he is, but the, that's me. So what, did, what happened when I became lottery director again, superintendent in, uh, you know, in, in October, when we went out and did uh, you know, uh, a complete agency overhaul for our advertising agencies? Well, the agencies that came back, who were in the finals, did a lot of research. And they shared the research what, with us. And this is the kind of stuff that happened in 1981 is happening now, that only 33, a third, after 30 years of having a lottery, a third of the people of the state of Illinois had a positive opinion about the lottery. Only 43%, which, you know, this is my, one of my agencies helping me do this. I would be more realist than, say, you know, 57% <laughs> think the lottery isn't for people like them. I mean, think about that. 57% of the adult population of the state of Illinois feels that negatively about the lottery. Um, and this is the sort of dra transformation in terms of language, in terms of attitude, that really has an impact on everything, whether it's an instant ticket you buy and you scratch off, or whether it's an iGaming site that you create, or whether it's the internet lottery test, that you have to change how you have caused, you have caused, lotteries have caused people to think about lotteries to a way which makes it more open for people to participate if they want to. One of the key statistics that drove the entire lottery privatization movement, which drove the research company that I founded, Independent Gaming Research, was that in almost every state, 80% of the people of the state approve of the lottery, but only 9 to 10% of the people of the state play the lottery. That gap is enormous. And that 80% approval dwarfs anything that anybody said over the last couple of days about iGaming or casinos or gaming in general. The population that a lottery appeals to is vast, huge, millions and millions and millions of people. So look about it, solely about the win? No, embracing the play values, that it might be fun to try to risk a buck against a 
you know, huge odds to win a $656 million prize from Mega Millions, and this proved that the lottery is absolutely a random event and absolutely you have a chance to win. One of the three tickets, as you know or may not know, was sold in a town called Red Bud, Illinois. I mean, and if that's not a Frank Capra movie, I don't know what it is. I mean, you know, for two weeks, people were asking me, when's the winner going to come forward? I said, I hope they don't, because I could walk around going, we had a winner in Red Bud, Illinois. You know, it was unbelievable. So solitary, social, complicated, fun, transactional. It's the experience, retailer-based, retailer-based. Again, deja vu all over again. When I came back in October, what's happened at the Illinois Lottery? We're selling the same products in the same retail locations as we were 30 years before. Uh, random acts, part of the fabric, desperate, someone like me. People think the lottery is played by desperate people. I mean, that obviously is not true, but I mean, it's something that's, you know, uppermost in your mind. You're trying to transform a brand. The lottery becomes my lottery. Barriers become possibilities, as they, all, as they always should be in any business that you're in. The advertising agency that won the business uh, began their presentation to us with an exceptional insight. They said, well, when we first uh, decided to pitch this, we went and talked to the hardest core of the hardest core of gamblers in Massachusetts. People in Massachusetts, the average per capita expenditure per Massachusetts adult on instant games alone are $343,565.14. They play all the time. I mean, they are just the hardest core of the hardest core. And my heart sank. I thought, oh my God, you know, geez, I don't, I don't care what those people think. I want to broaden the base of the player base in Illinois. And then they said, and then we talked to non-players in Illinois, and we discovered that they were the same people. And, you know, it piqued my interest. I set up, and how? And they showed a map of the world, and it was developed by the United Nations. And they said, because they're, both groups are optimistic. They're optimists about life. And we did this, we put this request into the United Nations. They did this survey that we copied, and it showed how many people, what percentage of adults in every state in the world are optimistic about their lives, are optimistic about where they're going to go, about where their country is going, about their families, everything. And it was god awful. I mean, you, when you'd go to some countries in Uzbekistan or something like that, it was 26%, you know, or I'm just guessing now, or you know, some countries in Africa, even lower, even Western Europe. I mean, even Ireland in the middle of this, uh, and, you know, god-awful recession that you're in, I mean, it was only like, you know, 52, 53 percent. And then they showed America, and in America, in the middle of the worst recession we've had since the Depression, it was 88 percent of Americans are optimistic about life, about their lives, about what's going to happen to them. And you can readily take that and equate it to luck. You can equate it to what you play the lottery for. Yeah, the odds are 120 million to one against. It only cost me a buck. I bought it when I walked through the retailer or I bought it online. What the heck? I'm an American. I believe that I can win as long as it's honest and as long as it's random. 83% optimistic. So I should set this up just a little bit. There was a decision made before I became lottery director to change Powerball, which is a block lotto game, from a dollar a play to $2 a play. A brilliant decision in the middle of a recession. How many people think that's a great decision? Thank you very much. And uh, I was told that the lottery had already decided upon creative. You know, we've got the creative in the bag, let's show it to you. And it was god awful. I mean, it was just, it was horrible. And it was a national spot that all the lotteries had decided to do. Now, can you imagine 40 lotteries getting together and deciding what a piece of creative should be? You remember the idea, the idea about how camels were created? It was kind of like that. So we threw it out, and we had on staff already an, what's called an ethnic agency in the United States. A lot of times, government agencies have a general market advertising agency and then an agency that's supposed to appeal to you know, ethnic audiences. And I had met with these guys, and they were really creative. I mean, they were just creative people. They weren't an ethnic agency. They were a great creative agency. So I said, no, let's give it to these guys. They're already under contract, and let them uh, come up with a, a, a spot that um, we just skipped it. There's a cursor someplace. There it is. I got it. And this is it, what they came up with. General market.
Now, if you're going to start trying to transform a brand and make people like you and make people think that it's cool, I can't imagine a better, more emotional spot than that. Coming from an agency that was never, ever given the opportunity to do that kind of work before, which is, again, is in essence the brand of a lottery, I would say. We went through the advertising uh, procurement and we uh, signed the, uh, the, winning, the winning bid was the agency I told you about with their whole analysis of uh, optimism. And from that analysis of optimism, they came up with this creative. Again, this is a branding commercial. We're just starting to try to change people's minds about our lottery. Say again? Yeah, you didn't see a video? I could act it out if you'd like. I could be the girl waking up. It's really an emotive spot. I hope you get a chance to see it. Can we go back on the slide and redo the link, or was it linked to the other video? It's right there. That's it. I have some slides from my last vacation for later, so I hope it continues to work. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I looked over, Michael, and I, I thought maybe I was the wrong angle because it did look dark. I thought it was a great radio spot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Try it again. You know what's good? Well, we, we haven't lost, we just lost the picture altogether. There you go. Okay, that's okay. We'll, we'll just skip it. It's uh, not, huh? No, that's the that's the red ball rolling through. Just give me a second. I'm just okay. gonna bump start it. Okay, can you guys see this? So I'm going to flip it really <laughs> fast, and you'll see the... Okay, can you go back and see the slide now? Can we see it? Aha! Great. That was Michael Caselli in the, with the beard and the one, so that's why he invited me. We put him in the commercial. But you can see again how that uh, is a brand transformational spot. Um, part of my duties when I first became lottery superintendent was to flog our, uh, our vendor and everybody else into actually um, putting into place the uh, internet lottery test, which had been passed as a law you know, two years before. Huh? Yeah. Why just skip back into the main thing and then just go back into that? Hmm. <laughs> well, I'll give you a little bit more background. You know, five years ago, six years ago, I was approached by a bunch of prominent Chicagoans about why uh, you couldn't buy lottery tickets over the internet. 
And uh, I began investigating it and uh, did a lot of research about you know, who would play, you know, what would it mean, how much would it mean in terms of revenue, uh, what would be the political dy you know, dynamics of it, uh, the dynamics of politics being always important in these things. Uh, is it, would it be perceived as an expansion of gambling? Would it be something that uh, people thought kids would play? Would they think it would affect uh, PowerPoint presentations and keynote speeches? <laughs> Uh, and we uh, discovered that all the political di dimensions didn't uh, cause anybody to think that it was a, uh, something they didn't want to do. The only uh, consideration was the one you would expect, which is security. You know, if you're going to buy tickets over the internet using a credit card, people were worried about their, you know, their uh, personal information. And uh, that research and the analysis of the kinds of people that would begin playing the lottery that don't play the lottery now and how much money it meant uh, drove the legislation that uh, resulted in a directive, a specific directive to the uh, Department of Revenue, which the lottery was part of then, to do this test. The legal side of it, meaning the uh, chief legal counsels for the House and Senate in Illinois, the chief legal counsel for the governor of Illinois. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, they all thought it was, is it working? Can you hear me? It was, uh, they all were of the opinion that under existing federal law, it was, under existing federal law, it was to dream. Under existing federal law, it was legal, and therefore um, the directive was to okay, we're back. go for it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, major vendors in the lottery business were nervous about the legalities of it. The Department of Revenue was nervous about the legalities of it. When I was appointed superintendent, I wasn't nervous about the legalities of it. And on December 23rd, the DOJ. Uh, you know, sent us a letter and said, you guys were right all along. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, reporters called from all over, uh, all of them asking the same thing, when are you gonna start selling poker, when are you gonna start doing poker on the internet? And I remember being called out of, it's tradition in our family to go to the movies on Christmas Eve, and I was called out of Mission Impossible by a New York Times reporter on Deadline, and I don't know, maybe somebody could tell, did he save the earth? I mean, did we stop the, I mean, we're all here, so it must have happened, but I don't know. So I talked about um, gaming and lotteries, and when you think about deja vu and the internet test and thinking about it, let me just go through a few points. A well-run lottery is one in which a lot of people play a little, not the same people playing a lot. Absolutely key reason that sales went up a billion dollars 25 years ago, and sales didn't go up another billion dollars for 27 years, because lotteries have spent a lot of time trying to sell the same products to the same people. But lotteries are different than most forms of gambling. They are by far the most popular form of gambling in the world. Um, gaming in general is not nearly as popular. It's huge, but it's huge for a number of reasons. We could argue the sort of the uh, philosophical basis of gaming's popularity being that it's artificially limited. You know, it's not usually except in places like Las Vegas, et cetera, built to actually uh, handle demand. It's usually artificially limited and demand kind of overawes it. Uh, gaming, gambling, lottery, uh, casinos, for the most part, concentrate exactly what you guys have been talking about for a couple of days, player acquisition, maximizing the player's experiences, whether it's spending money or having fun on the site or whatever. And lotteries have sort of grabbed a lot of this from gambling, as you can see from my previous statements about it, and that is that odds and winning are the key drivers of participation. But just look at these percentages that you see on the right. This is from just a year ago by the American Gambling Association. This is Gaming Association. These are the percentages of participation. There was just a, a, a report published three days before I came here, just to give you another example from the United Kingdom. And again, look at the percentages of um, betting on horse races, gambling on fruit and slot machines, private betting with family, et cetera, are in the single digits. And above that are the, the uh, much larger groups of people that participate in the lottery and why it's so important to sort of protect the lottery's brand. Again, one of the things that people don't understand, even to this day, is what are we trying to do in Illinois with our internet gambling test? It's very specific. It came from legislation. It is not an iGaming site. It is testing the technology surrounding selling just Mega Millions tickets and Lotto tickets online. It is specific to a period of time, 36 to 48 months. Key parts of the legislation are geolocation and you know, protections against play by minors. That's what we're doing. We have no uh, you know, legislative basis for doing anything other than that. We have a, law, a, a piece of legislation right now which will allow us to add Powerball to this mix, but that's all we're doing right now. Again, 
Um, it's specific to large jackpot games. We're a monopoly. Player acquisition is not a, a consideration. We have infrequent draws, two a week. Uh, we have fixed ticket prices. Grand prize is dynamic. That's what really drives people's uh, uh, attention toward these games. Um, it's not an action-oriented, lotteries are not action-oriented. You know, infrequent draws, high odds, um, very few prizes when you think about it. So many of the considerations, technical considerations, that were brought to bear for an internet lottery test and dismissed by the lottery all had to do with the technical side of iGaming as everybody understands it now, which it means you have lots of games you play, you win and lose, win and lose, win and lose, you have to have electronic wallets, you have to have some way of paying the people and then they are able to buy more. That doesn't really come to play in the internet lottery test when you're only de dealing with lotto, mega millions, and potentially Powerball. The potential audience, though, is huge. You know, the, the, it's absolutely enormous for existing lottery games. We did a significant amount of research. This is the coolest quote happened the morning that we started. As soon as I found out that somebody had played who was not a subscriber, I had our PR people call him directly and just talk to him and listen to this quote. My dad has always played the lottery at the grocery store, but the new site speaks my language. So I logged on and played. 30-year-old guy, that's their target market for all of this. Feelings about the internet option, I won't go through all this, but it's all you know, pretty positive, you know, not negative at all. Purchase intent, pretty high. You know, when you ask people about anything new, you know, they tend not to say that they want to do it. But these, uh, these are significant. Now, like, just like I say, IGI, Independent Gaming Research, is a company that did all this research. And they and I came up with, five or six years ago, the first definition of what a lottery player is and what a lottery player isn't. And it's self-defined, and it's now sort of common in the industry. And it's Joes and Jacks. Joes play once a week or more. And Jack is everybody else. And our moniker was, we know Jack. And we hope people didn't add the next uh, word to that phrase. Uh, one other thing about this slide, which is interesting, is the bottom thing. And you can see that uh, uh, somebody yesterday was talking about the uh, an organized effort in New York to prohibit internet gambling on uh, internet lottery sales because the uh, bricks and mortar retailers are so much against it. This is the biggest boon for internet, for bricks and mortar retailers that you could ever imagine. I mean, and lots and lots of people who walk through retailers now and don't even see us will now start walking through the same retailer and start to buy us. And that's not, the problem isn't the total number of people in retailers. The problem is that very few of them actually buy lottery products. So when you take all this and you add it all up, you can see 600,000 to a million, a million new players, new lottery players. That's a significant amount, number of people. I mean, if they all start playing five or 10 bucks a week, you know, two draws a week, you can see that the amount of money uh, possible with this is enormous. <clears throat> Again, who, who's going to play it? People who don't play the lottery now. And when you ask them, you know, if you, if you buy a Mega Millions ticket over the internet, whether you win or lose, we'd be more open to buying a lottery ticket at a bricks and mortar. They go, yeah, God, you know, I'd start noticing it. And we have these wonderful sort of specially, especially the instant games in Illinois where the proceeds go to something specific. Remember the point I made about your losses have to help something? We have specific games where all the losses go to help breast cancer research or multiple sclerosis research or veterans uh, causes or AIDS research. Now, again, most lotteries don't do specialty games. The Illinois Lottery, before I came back, ignored them. I think they are enormous brand images and the way to get lots of new people to play. That's another interesting thing is that people don't realize how wide um, these diseases and causes uh, permeate any culture. If you, I mean, you're not in the United States, but if you're in the United States and I said, how many people here are related to a veteran? Almost everybody would raise their hand. How many people are veterans? Two-thirds of you would stand up. How many people know somebody who has breast cancer? Up until I came back, the games were all, the breast cancer game was ignored. If it was not ignored, it was, well, we just want to appeal to victims. No, you don't want to just appeal to victims. You want to appeal to the people who know the victims. They want to do something to help their friends, to help their mothers, to help their sisters. It's a very interesting thing. So with this, you do the internet lottery test, you do the $656 million grand prize, you generate all this new participation, and what do you do the next week? Well, me being a marketer, the next week is you talk about the multiple sclerosis game, because those people will be open to that kind of game. <clears throat> Lessons learned to date. Key, key thing. Take out your notepads. There are pros and cons to starting the grand prize at $656 million. The only example we had was in Saturn in 1433 BC. They had an enormous $6.2 billion solar credit prize. 
but the transmission through the Hubble telescope was difficult. The interface, this is the absolute key of all keys, must be easy, open, intuitive. Michael Gaselli has an excellent article in his uh, most recent edition of an outside third party looking at our interface. I urge you to read it. Uh, it was exactly what I was saying from October on. The product must reflect the product sold. You don't need a lot of this, um, as I said, electronic wallets, ability to do this, ability to do that, when you're only selling Lotto, Mega Millions, and Powerball. If you're going to go into these other areas, you need to have that capability. When you need that capability, you should add it. And the one thing I did learn was that no one was interested in everything I just said over the last 35 minutes. They were only interested as to when we were going to begin poker. So, <laughs> so that's a key thing. So when are we going to begin poker? Well, let's, let's sum up and finish here today and answer any questions, which is, we talked about the Internet Lottery Test, the Powerball, the DOJ letter, GeoControl, A Control, iGaming, poker, my other, oh my. Oh my, meaning that in the last couple of weeks in Illinois, um, Illinois legislators are really on the, I think, the cutting edge of this whole gaming, understanding gaming, understanding good public policy and effective business practice. And they recognized that uh, everybody was coming to them, every lobbyist in the world was coming to them with various ideas based on the December 23rd DOJ letter. Because as an earlier uh, speaker, the professor from the University of New York, or, uh, yeah, right, uh, pointed out what the DOJ letter basically says is that you can do anything. You can do anything other than sports betting. So if you're going to do anything, what are you going to do? And in Illinois, they're really looking long term. And they're recognizing all the discussion you guys have had within your industry for a very long time about marketing costs and player acquisition costs and competition between various gaming sites. And the idea is it may be effective business practice and good public policy to have one site and have all the private companies underneath selling us their services. But since we're a monopoly, and since we're run by the state, then you can not compete amongst yourselves, but you can compete amongst your products. And you can ultimately can generate more money for good causes or to split with existing gaming vendors. And if you get there, the firstest with the mostest, which is my favorite quote from the Civil War by uh, General Forrest, if you're the firstest, then you can start building these you know, large poker uh, you know, groups that start with Illinois and maybe continue with Illinois as other states come on. So that's sort of a brief overview of where we are right now. The Internet Lottery Test is a couple of months old. Powerball will be added. The interface will be changed. The uh, bill before the legislature, I would disagree with the, uh, the good professor, uh, may indeed be caught up in uh, politics and not pass this session. It may indeed be. We shall see. If not, it certainly will resurface itself in the veto session in the fall. And it was very, I thought, think, I thought gratifying that the legislature and the governor's office and others in the state of Illinois thought if they were going to do iGaming that they you know, recognized the, uh, the great management team that we have at the Illinois Lottery and the uh, view that we have of being dedicated to good public policy and effective business practice and decided to put it underneath us. Whether we do it or not, I don't know, but if we are asked to do it, I hope we will do it well. So thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions. Michael, thank you. Um, I've got a number of questions, but I'd like to start with any audience questions. Are there any audience questions? Michael, very informative. Uh, two questions. One was the, the experience in DC. How did that benefit or what was the lessons learned from that when you were developing your strategy? And secondly, what do you see as the hindrance for the other states? You know, you, you referenced the retailers, uh, you know, being against lost revenues and incoming revenues from going online. Is that a big problem for other states or what, what are going to be the, bo the, the barriers there? Well, e excellent questions. I, I think, again, I don't think that, I mean, again, the lottery industry is rather sclerotic, you know? I mean, that's what I'm saying, deja vu all over again. It's really dominated, dominated by several vendors and there's not a lot of the kind of uh, incredible, um, I don't know, just fervor and ferment and new games and new technologies and all that kind of stuff going on in it. So. A lot of this is informed by that kind of um, A to B view of what they do. So in Illinois, and in my opinion, based on a lot of research that I've done, there is enormous upside to selling lottery products over the internet, especially block lotto games. 
enormous, 600,000 to a million people, hundreds of millions of dollars of income, but it's not sexy, you know, it's not new. It's like, you know, you have to really understand this whole thing about 80% approval, 10% play, blah, blah, blah. What's sexy and new is to say, well, we want, to, we want the lottery to do casino gaming, you know, under the umbrella of our existing lottery law and under the uh, auspices of the December 23rd letter. DC was going in that direction. They were going straight to iGaming, you know, straight to a Camelot kind of site or Finland or whoever else you could say. And that was pretty much immaterial to what we were doing. You know, I mean, the materiality of what we were doing was to try to figure out how to handle demand when you had a $656 million prize, not how to handle problem gambling or multiple games within a half hour stretch where someone signs on and plays all the time. So I, I, we didn't really look at them and really didn't look at what they were trying to do because we were convinced that we had a legal basis for doing what we would, were doing and we were involved in a very uh, cooperative way with our uh, vendor, Northstar, in attempting to um, change what they had designed into something that would be effective for this internet lottery test. And that's an ongoing project. I mean, it's not over yet. I mean, we're really, really working hard on that. Uh, I think the bricks and mortar retailer question is one that uh, I think a lot of people can learn from what Illinois did uh, very proactively from December 23rd on, which was to attempt to uh, educate uh, retailers, and they're very savvy people, especially if they're organized in you know, interest groups of uh, gasoline mini marts or whatever else, or the 7-Eleven groups, uh, to uh, the fact that you know basically 100% of all the adults in every lottery jurisdiction in the United States walk through a lottery retailer every week but they don't buy tickets. So any, nothing that we're going to do on the internet is going to affect that. You know, what you need to do and what we need to do is make us more re relevant and make us more visible and selling tickets over the internet to people who buy most of their stuff over the internet will, we think, open them to buying at retail. What was really funny and interesting and will be part of my novel when I write out when I, when I leave this job again is that this all came down to a Senate Executive Committee meeting where we had the Illinois Retail Merchants Association, very powerful lobbying group, appearing in opposition to the bill where we could allow Powerball to be part of our internet lottery test. And I had met with these guys three or four times. I'd take, I, as a matter of fact, one of our meetings, we did sort of like a dog and pony show like this, and there's probably the same number of people in the room and they just weren't getting it. They weren't, they, I don't know whether they were not getting it or they just, you know, were, you know, they just thought state government was always trying to do something bad as opposed to doing something good. And at the end, I said, well, great, you know, I mean, you know how to solve this? I'll buy everybody a drink. Let's go over to the bar. Thinking that maybe one or two guys would come, the whole group just came to the bar. And I had to buy. I mean, so never, never be prepared to do that again. But it, when the president of the association got up and said, yeah, the lottery's briefed us, we think this, we think that, but we can't believe that the state of Illinois would take Powerball along with Lotto and Mega Millions, and only sell it on the internet, not let us sell it. And we went, what? They had misinterpreted the law. They had misinterpreted what the lottery was doing. They thought we were taking it away from them and only selling those games on the internet as opposed to selling them on the internet and at the retail location. And it was liter literally a, an Emily Latella moment from Saturday Night Live, you know? Uh, you know, I'm sorry. And then they supported us because they then recognized all this research we did really indicated that there would be a significantly positive financial impact on them, above and beyond selling instant tickets. And they have many other issues that we're dealing with, you know, or I'm dealing with about you know, just, uh, you know, maximizing sales in an ethical and socially responsible manner, above and beyond just price point, you know, percentage manipulation. So, any other questions? I promise not to answer them so in such a long fashion. Um, yeah, and what, what other stakeholders besides the retailers that you go up against? Well, anti-gambling people. I mean, anti-gambling people are against any, anything new, and, and you know, their, their arguments are fairly easily dismissed. And I'll, again, this is just sort of guidance if you are going to uh, advise any other states. The key thing about selling lottery tickets over the Internet, uh, which I learned from the National Lottery Commission of Great Britain, who invited my company, Independent Lottery Research, to meet with them is it's the first time we've ever been able to control how much people spend, how much they play. Uh, right now we can't. Uh, we just had an incident in Illinois while I was here of some retailer getting um, depressed and for two days in a row he got up and he just pushed the daily game, you know, quick pick button on his, on his machine and ran off $165,000 worth of tickets. And we don't have a system 
or North Star doesn't have a system. We used to, back in the day, my first time, that would send a red flag up saying, uh, by the way, you know, uh, Jones's <laughs> Mini Mart and Tap, which has been averaging $9,000 a week in sales since 1980, just sold $276,000 worth of daily game tickets yesterday. We have no mechanism. I can't believe we have no mechanism for doing that. But on the internet, if someone, and we have in place right now, um, upper limits. You know, you can't play more than $100 per drawing. Um, so uh, besides the retailers and the anti-gambling people, I don't think there are any uh, anti, you know, internet lottery test constituencies. If the lottery goes to instant games on the internet, I think the retailers come back into play. If the lottery goes to quasi, you know, uh, casino kind of games, you'll bring in uh, the riverboats and the horse tracks and all those kinds of people will have considerations. But uh, I think the big one is the bricks and mortar. Um, what administrative percentage do you take and how do you promote that to the public? What administrative percentage, percentage. do we take? Right. Well, we don't really. You know, this, it, it, that language doesn't apply to what lotteries do. We, you know, we have a prize percentage payout and a, a commission to retailers, and uh, everything else is profit to us. So, on a, on a, the thing that's interesting about the internet lottery test when you're selling Lotto, Mega Millions, and Powerball is that those are hugely profitable games. They're a 50% prize payout game. So, we get everything uh, outside of whatever the percentage of our overhead expenses are, which is tiny would then be profit to the Common School Fund and to the, uh, well actually from the Internet Lottery Test, all the money goes to the Capital Development Fund. So let's say 46 cents out of every dollar played on Mega Millions goes to the Capital Development Fund. <coughs> Sorry? Do, do you promote that fact? That, that well, I mean, it's just, it's just known. See, this is part of the whole thing of, you know, gaming people looking at the lotteries they don't know, and they can't imagine, why would anybody, why would anybody play a game that only has a 50% 50, 50 prize payout? You know, why? You know, and you, like, they go around and confront people on the street and shake them, you know, and try to convince them not to, and then millions and millions and millions of people play, and some guy from Redbud wins. Uh, one of our people from Redbud is here today. I mean, please. <laughs> Uh, will you be offering an affiliate program, and if so, how will it work? Well, I think you're talking about if this legislation passes, you know, where the state of Illinois is going to put together an iGaming uh, section separate from the lottery. You know, whether I mean, right now the legislation, I think, calls for a separate division under me, but separate from the lottery, having a lot of its own kind of rules and regulations, stuff like that. And we have several... Um, uh, experts, Scarlett Robinson being one of them who's been advising us on this, and I've, I've gotten to be somewhat cognizant of the whole affiliate program, etc. Sounds extremely interesting and promising. That's one of the reasons I accepted Michael's kind invitation is to learn more about your end of the business and understand what affiliates mean and this whole idea of, you know, poker populations and things like that. That's, uh, it's interesting. But I think Michael made the point yesterday that when you look at this bill, all the people in this room and out on that trade show floor should be enthusiastic about it. Because again, if you eliminate the competitive side, you know, and the player acquisition side, and you think about all the technical things underneath that and marketing things underneath it and game development things un underneath it and financial transactions and all that other kind of stuff, those will all be run by private businesses. You know? So it's an enormous opportunity. And how, I mean, if I'm in charge of it, how we bid that stuff and how we award those contracts will be done totally in the open. It'll be completely in the open, and we'll award it to the best bidders. And it will be a gold rush, I think, for new business in, uh, in Illinois. Michael, you mentioned, you mentioned um, the riverboats and the tracks. Um, how do the riverboat casinos and the tracks feel about you and, and the lottery department perhaps getting the monopoly on online gaming in the state? I think it's all too new. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is, a, this is separate from me. You know, my, my uh, responsibility is running the Illinois Lottery and overseeing the North Star contract. And this whole new iGaming bill, you know, came out of the legislature, you know, with some sort of uh, strategic, you know, uh, discussions with me about just what would be good public policy and what do you think. But they made the decision of, of how they wanted to do it. And I understand that they had a meeting yesterday, I think, uh, between the... Uh, legislative leaders and the various um, lobbyists representing other gaming interests in Illinois. And it went very positively because, again, when you think about it, if you then 
have a single gaming platform and you ultimately share revenue with them, which is probably going to be one of the compromises as you go down, to me it seems like a pretty good idea. You know, as opposed to, I mean, Michael Johnson Company, my former company, I had to get rid of all my companies, by the way, to take this job again. I think we were the only people ever to do business in the lottery business. We did the introduction of off-track betting in Illinois, so we did a lot of horse racing business. We did the World Gaming Congress Expo in, in Las Vegas for many, many years, so on the the uh, casino side, and then we created the whole Riverboat Gaming Congress and Expo also. So we, we kind of have, a, have had our feet in all of these different areas, and we understand the dynamics. And the first dynamic is always fear. You know, you're going to take something away from me, or you're gonna, I'm going to be screwed somehow. I think this, in reaction to the DOJ letter, at least as a starting point for discussion, I think everybody kind of gets it. You kind of get it, I think. You know, that's what you were saying yesterday. I don't know, maybe there's a hole in the, in the concept, but... Uh, the first meeting supposedly went pretty well. Uh, and I, I must say that when we did the off-track betting uh, introduction in Illinois, we did some great creative, you know. And every time we went to, it was a, the contract was actually a, a percentage of, you know, sales or something like that, and we represented all of racing. And every time we would go in to show the new campaign to the various tracks, every track owner said, when are, you, when are you running the creative? We go, well, we're, you know, 35 weeks out of the year. No, no, you want to run it during our racing season. Screw those guys at Arlington. Don't run it during theirs. I hate those guys. You know, sportsmen, you got to help sportsmen. They hate each other, you know, and uh, they're highly, highly competitive. Maybe this will bring everybody together, you know, in a really cool way. Um, you launched during the $600 million jackpot. What technical hitches did that expose? And did that give you... Um, uh, I guess more hope as to the potential for this than you might have had had you launched it during a normal week. I'm I'm incredibly bullish about this. I think I think we have it's a work in progress. Uh, the problems that we had on the 656 million dollar week were not demand problems. You know that was the uh, right. and which is a which which is a, a double double headed coin when you really think about it. Um, what we had were. Um, um, interface problems. We had several shutdowns. We had people who were confused, and that's no way to start. Uh, but someone had to do it first, and we were the first people to do it. And I think the more our, our website begins to emulate iTunes and American Airlines and people like that, uh, the higher sales will be, the more people will register, the better the experience will be. And we're working very, very hard with Northstar to get that kind of interface in place. Uh, what payment options are you offering at, at present? I mean, for people to win? For, for if people, people actually win, purchase. Well, I mean, if people win, right, if people register right now, there's a, there's a system that's in place that's similar to our subscription system where you can actually have a, a, a Visa debit card issued to you with your winnings on it. Uh, it's, it's not something that has um, worked particularly well so far. And what we are really trying to do is separate two functions, which was always what my view of this was one function was play, make it really, really easy to play. You know, but you can buy a ticket. And then if you win, then you're obviously much more incentivized to give us a lot more information to collect your winnings. And then the concept behind collecting your winnings in my in my view will be make it as easy as possible. And again, remember the ethos is different. I mean we're not trying to pay them so they can play more immediately. We're just trying to, you know, uh, square the circle and say, yeah, you you played and uh, you got the uh, mega ball and you won three bucks. You know, who knows what we're going to say. Maybe we'll say, you know, we can, you can come to a lottery retailer or a lottery office and collect your three bucks or we have a rule that it has to accumulate the 25 and then we send you a check. And we're figuring all that stuff out. But you got to remember these games don't have a lot of winners. Right. I mean, the only real winners are the, you know, $10,000 and up. And, you know, we're not going to pay that through the internet anyway. You're going to have to file a claim for them, and we're going to have to figure out whether you're over the age of 18 and whether you're in the state of Illinois and all that kind of stuff anyway. Right. But, um, you know, rationality and reason are what's guiding us in this kind of stuff. And what about deposit methods? What deposit methods do you currently offer? We don't do... Are you referring to deposit in what sense? To, to, to actually make a deposit to purchase tickets in the future. Well, we're trying to eliminate that. We're trying to make you just be able to buy a ticket using a credit card, and that's it. Visa and MasterCard. Yeah, that's so what you'd make your, Yeah, you'd make your yeah. purchase fees in MasterCard. Um, and what percentage increase does that 600,000 to a million new players represent uh, to your lottery? 
Well, I, th I think the I think it's something like a hundred and forty million dollars is what we would expect, which would be something like ten percent, you know, just from Mega Millions, because people really aren't playing Lotto. I mean, they'll play Mega Millions when the prize. Again, those figures that I gave you about how many people would be attracted, it's kind of interesting, is that human psychology is that uh, people get interested when it's $100 million or more. You know, 80 million isn't enough, you know, 75, 78, uh, $100 million or more. Now, at $100 million or more, you can, you know, look at your year and say that in a typical year between Mega Millions and Powerball, we'll probably have 30 weeks of the year where there's a prize above $100 million so that you start you're extrapolating these things, and they're geometric, really, if the, if the models work. And the models won't work unless the interface is easy and intuitive. Models won't work unless you can buy a ticket right away. Models won't work if we don't have a mechanism for uh, getting the money to you. So all of this stuff, as I said, is a work in progress, but I feel very bullish about it. Did you need to bring in much, um, uh, did you need to hire in more staff or uh, people who are educated in online gaming? Um, before you launch this, or were you able to do it with your existing lottery team? Well, again, one of, the, one of the key challenges in what I'm trying to do is, because I've inherited a contract that was awarded to a private manager, is to figure out what kinds of, um, st what the structure should be to give them, to incentivize them, to allow them to act like a private company, to allow them to have uh, the ability to fail, as well as to su succeed. Um, while at the same time understanding that the lottery has ultimate authority, authority and responsibility to all of this stuff. If anything ba bad, it, everything that's bad has happened since I have been there, and I've been very lucky, very few bad things have happened. It, whether they're North Star things or, Michael, or uh, Illinois lottery things, it's the Illinois lottery that, you know, is, uh, who's called on to, to work with it, you know. So, um, you know, I think that uh, <clears throat> you just have to work it out. You know, you have to f work out the areas of authority and responsibility and who's responsible for what and who's responsible for doing this. And in general, uh, there is an emerging brand, I should have said this at the beginning, I think, in the lottery world, which is Lottomatica. Yeah. So Lottomatica, an Italian company that runs half the Italian lottery, owns GTEC. Lottomatica, in essence, owns 80% of Northstar. <clears throat> we just changed our CEO for Northstar from... Uh, a GTEC person to a Lottomatica person. And that emerging brand, with their experience and what they've done in Italy, I think is a very positive you know, part of what will be going on in the next uh, few months. Do we have some more audience questions? Yes, in the back. <coughs> you want to see the ad again? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. To what extent have uh, the other states, the other state lotteries are obviously taken notice of what you're doing being a pioneer. To what extent have they reached out to you in regards to understanding your processes with an eye towards regulation and implementation? There's a great deal of uh, curiosity. Um, what I've tried to do is, <laughs> and, uh, you know, kind of breaking the mold, is uh, I've tried to hold a series of uh, conference calls uh, with my key technical staff. And by the way, Michael, I didn't answer your question completely. We've tried to hire experts in the field to come in and, uh, and advise us so that we sit down with Northstar, who have their experts. We're trying to get sort of a what's the best possible solution. Uh, that's where Scarlett Robinson comes in. That's where a, a couple of other people have come in to, uh, to help us. And we'll be doing that ongoing. We don't have someone on staff who has any you know, capability really in, in, the, in that area. What was your question again? Uh, it was about uh, have other uh, lottery agencies oh, yeah, reached yeah. out to you. So we did this. Uh, we did a couple of conference calls where we let only lottery directors phone in, and we answered any question that they wanted. And I think it was extremely effective, an extremely effective way to discuss it with them without a filter of vendors or anything like that. And and I don't know whether they're actually. Um, they're curious as to what we're doing, but I don't know whether we've convinced them yet that our view of it is correct because they don't know yet whether they're going to ultimately be responsible for an, an iGaming site where you have to have electronic wallets and all that kind of stuff, or whether they're going to, their remit is going to be to do what we're doing, which is traditional lottery games. And I think my advice to the model, and I think it's had some effect, is just you know, keep it simple to begin with because these big technical questions haven't been answered. The interface question really hasn't been answered. 
correctly, I don't think. Geolocation and age control haven't been answered. Uh, read you know, Michael's excellent article about the geolocation challenges based on just browser. Uh, and as those get sorted out in Illinois, we'll communicate that to the industry. As this iGaming bill that's floating through the Illinois House and Senate right now gets sorted out, it'll give a tremendous boost if it's passed to other legislator, legislative bodies as to what, what to do. And if it comes under the Illinois lottery, I'd say right now it's 70-30 against. I'm sure it'll wind up at the, you know, the gaming board. But if it comes under us, we will share with everybody, including you guys, you know, what we're doing in terms of trying to do it the right way. Um, we talked a little bit about the future, and I know this is a trial and a test, and we talked a little bit about um, you know, what might happen to legislative permitting. But um, something that's uh, obvious when you're developing your interface and you're developing better ways to get to your audience, maybe uh, mobile and app is something that we talked quite a lot about in this conference. Um, is that something on the development timeline? I was flabbergasted that we didn't have a mobile app to begin with. I mean, it seems pretty logical to me that you'd have the technology to do that from the get-go. I mean, to be able to buy Mega Millions and lotto tickets over a phone should absolutely be a no-brainer. But we'll, you know, we're working on that now. Biggest problem with that, obviously, is geolocation, not the technical part of the, the phone. Right. Um, and any further questions? Then my last question is going to be, were you scared being the first one? The day before you turned that computer on, were you nervous? Uh, I, I, you know, so I, I, I was pretty phlegmatic about it because I, I had spent so much time looking at how this could work. I was, I was really concerned about the interface. You know, I was really concerned that people would uh, find it too difficult and, um, and wouldn't participate. I was, uh, you know, any problems I had with that, uh, there was a yin and yang to life. Uh, probably the 20 minutes in, my personal attorney called me to tell me how impossible it was and how ridiculous it was and who did he call to complain? <laughs> he just called me. <laughs> and then the next person who called me was my son, who's uh, 28 years old, and he said, Dad, I bought lottery tickets over the internet. And I go, what'd you think? And he goes, easier than buying tickets to a jam band through you know, the internet. So he thought it was easy. One person thought it was hard. It's also be kind of funny, I think, for you guys to know that um, my former boss, the guy that brought me into state government, was a big guy, wonderful governor named James Thompson. He's a very bluff, you know, hearty kind of guy. And three or four days in, my secretary comes in and says, uh, the governor called you. I go, Governor Thompson? She goes, yes. And I thought he was calling me because to say, Michael, you know, after 25 years, you came back, you know, on Red Bud, Illinois, and $656 million, and those commercials are great. And, and you, know, the, you know, the internet thing is just fantastic. And I call him back, and he goes, hey, you know, I tried to sign on, and they took my money, and I didn't get able to play, and who do I call? I go, well, you called me. I had the same answer. I said, let, me, let me put you on hold, and I'll get someone to call you. So he didn't give me any praise. He just gave me grief about the, the interface. So <laughs> It's sometimes good to be first. It's sometimes scary to be first. Yeah, and as I said, I, I, I must just say it took a tremendous amount of work to get this thing up and going. I congratulate Northstar on it. I congratulate them completely on the fact that they have understood you know, that uh, the interface needs to be uh, improved upon and that we're working very closely with them to get this done right. And I would just urge anybody who's looking at the, inter the, Illinois, at the Illinois Lottery's internet test is that someone had to be first. We were. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be agile enough to be the best. So thank you very much. On behalf of all of us, thank you very much for being brave enough and pragmatic yeah. enough to be first. And we wish you the best of luck on the test. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you.